Good morning, everyone, and welcome to today's symposia, Integrating Geoscience into the Green Deal. The European Green Deal is a roadmap for turning climate and environmental cha challenges into opportunities to create a more sustainable European society and economy. It sets ambitious targets, including reaching climate neutrality in Europe by 2050, preserving and protecting biodiversity, and adopting zero pollution action plans for air, water, and soils. Science is used in the policymaking process for a lot of different reasons. It is used to help identify the issues and put them on the agenda. It is used to help determine the consequences of any policy action or inaction. And it's used to monitor and evaluate the targets as they progress so that we can see where more work is needed. The European Green Deal is no exception to this. My name is Chloe Hill, and I am the EGU's policy officer and moderator for this session that is going to be looking into some of the ways in which science and specifically geoscience is able to support the Green Deal's ambitious targets. This session was initially inspired by the EGU's publication, How Geoscience Can Support the Green Deal, which provides some very specific examples of areas where geoscience has or could contribute to it. However, while we may be going into some specific examples today, this session is going to take a much broader look into how scientists can engage in, in the Geo Green Deal, where more support is needed and what is coming next. Now, to help us address all of these topics and to answer your questions, we do, of course, have a fabulous lineup of speakers. So our first speaker today is Yaroslav Myziak, who is the Director of the Research D Division Risk Assessment and Adaptation Strategies. He is a member and rapporteur of the European Commission's Mission Board on Climate Adaptation and Societal Transformation and a member of the Scientific Committee of, of the European Environmental Agency. He's also a member of the European Science Technology Advisory Group on the United Nations Office for Disaster Risk Reduction and a member of the expert group on slow onset events. Yaro's research focuses on risk assessment and governance, including behavioural responses to risks and risk reduction measures, risk perception and transformational societal change, environmental economics and climate adaptation. Our second speaker today is Claire Chenu, who is a professor of soil science at Agro Paris Tech and primarily undertakes research in the area of organic carbon dynamics. She is involved in the pol science policy practice interface and in awareness raising activities on soils. She was the a lead author in the IPEBS assessment on biodiversity and ecosystem services for the European and Central Asia division. She has also chaired the scientific committee of the GeoSol program. Furthermore, she was nominated Special Ambassador of Soils in 2015 by the FAO, is an EGU medal recipient, and she now coordinates the Horizon 2020 European jo Joint Co-Fund Program, Soil. Our third speaker today is Joe Eisen. Uh, he is the director of the Rainforest Foundation UK, an NGO that is dedicated to supporting the rights of local communities and indigenous peoples of the world's rainforest. An anthropologist by training, Joe has been with the Rainforest Foundation UK for 12 years after having previously worked for an environmental environmental NGOs and indigenous organizations in Gabon, India and Guyana. Now, our fourth and final speaker today is Diedrich Sampson, the head of cabinet for the first vice president of the European Commission, Franz Timmermans. He has therefore played a key role in the creation and implementation of the European Green Deal, but unfortunately won't be able to join the session today until 10 a.m., so I will give him a proper introduction then. Now, before we do get into this session and before I pass the virtual microphone over to our speakers, I'm going to start with a little bit of an overview of how this session today is going to work. So we are, of course, going to start with our speakers who will give some presentations um, and my co-conveners will actually ask some of their questions to our speakers as well after this. 
And then the second half of the session today will focus on a panel discussion. So this is where we need your input. We will be looking at the questions that you are asking and I will be asking those questions to our speakers. Okay, so that's basically all from me. Um, I am very much looking forward to this session. And without further ado, I'll pass over to our first speaker, Yaro. Thank you very much, Chloe. It's a pleasure to be uh, with you and thank you for having me. I will share my screen. Hopefully that's work. Um, so good morning again to everybody. Um, I'm working at Euro Mediterranean Center on Climate Change and the University of Venice. And my talk will be about the mission, um, research and innovation mission under the Horizon Europe that is dedicated to climate adaptation and societal transformation. Now, we all probably agree that uh, um, the global environmental change requires a bold and transformative action in order to address the root causes uh, that generate and reproduce economic, social, political, environmental problem and inequalities. But how to do that? It's, uh, it's a not a simple question. And there are a number of uh, methodological uh, approaches or, or proposals that are very different in, uh, in terms of what they cover, the depth, breadth, form, spatial or temporal scale, levers of change, outcomes, evolution, and so on. Uh, we do agree that uh, we really need a radical change, radical change that is uh, you know, a clear shift from unsustainable practices in the past. And so rather than incremental or marginal change, we really need something else. But how to design such a transformative change? Now, you, you probably know that the uh, uh, European Council and European Parliament has a, a, a achieved an agreement on the EU climate law that imposes a reduction of uh, greenhouse gas emission by 20, uh, by 55% until 2030 and uh, to achieve basically uh, net zero uh, carbon neutrality uh, by, uh, by 20, uh, 2050. So this is the climate mitigation part. The climate adaptation part has a adaptation strategy, which is uh, very ambitious and was released uh, or adopted in February this year, a couple of months ago. Um, and uh, closely related to the new adaptation strategy is the mission on climate adaptation and societal transformation. So the mission, this mission is one of five missions uh, that are part of Horizon Europe, uh, uh, research and, uh, and innovation framework. Um, the conceptual foundation of the mission-oriented research was laid down by Professor Mariana Mazzucato in uh, the seminal work uh, published in 2018. And now each of those five missions uh, is supposed to operate a portfolio of actions like research projects, policy measures, or legislative initiatives. So it's not only about research innovation, it's basically, it has two parts, uh, policy and research innovation that is informing and contributing to the policy change. Now, our mission board has released uh, the set of recommendation in September last year. It's called the Climate Resilient Europe, uh, preparing Europe for climate disruption and accelerating the um, transformation to climate resilience and just Europe. The board is uh, uh, chaired by uh, Connie Hedegaard, the former um, commissioner for climate action and includes 14 outstanding researchers. And I had the pleasure to be part of it and act as a rapporteur. Now, what we are doing now is uh, uh, to design an implementation uh, plan, a blueprint, how to translate this set of recommendation into practical operations. Uh, the missions have not yet been endorsed and adopted by European Commission. That still has to happen and will probably happen in, uh, in uh, June or July. Now, the core of our implementation plan is this, what we call transformation ladder. And it contains six steps uh, uh, through which the communities and the region will go and, uh, and develop a tangible solution. The first and most important part is uh, to improve the access to climate risk information and, uh, and address identify the opportunities arising from better uh, understanding of risk and better coping with risk. So uh, this ladder, as you see it, the upper part is basically what, more the policy part, what is expected from the communities and regions to be put in place. 
And the lower part is where the research and innovation will contribute to those, to those steps and to those areas. So first step, assessing opportunities and risk. We really expect that basically all, all communities and regions by 2030 will have an easy access to climate risk profiles, will understand their climate risk and will update emergency management plans so as to be able to answer to climate disruptions. The next part is uh, that's very important. It's the uh, DNA of, of the mission is to mobilize partnership and citizen engagement. And here we imagine citizen alliances, citizen assemblies, action groups so that uh, come together and uh, agree on what needs to be done and uh, assign a sort of letter of intent or uh, letter of commitment towards uh, this long-term project of, uh, of uh, uh, reforming the existing systems. Um, the research and innovation side will uh, contribute to this by uh, emphasis on risk assessment, improving digital knowledge services, and in the second step, inclusive participatory governance and social justice. Now, after the, <clears throat> after the partnership and engagement has been uh, accomplished, uh, the communities and the region will develop a um, midterm vision, a vision of the sustainable future, vision of the future they want to live in, and uh, the adaptation pathways, how to get there. And, uh, and this, will, uh, this will end up in a locally powered climate resilient and sustainable development strategy. And the, uh, the research innovation will contribute with the uh, behavioral research on behavioral aspect of social transformation, scenario buildings, and the uh, robust decision making. The fourth step is uh, uh, invest in innovative solution and testing uh, innovative solution on ground. And there we think of portfolio of tested transformative solutions for resilient growth. And uh, there is a huge uh, volume of research innovation that uh, will focus on social, economic, ecological, technological, organizational, and business model innovation. Uh, the last two steps are basically to upscale the innovation to um, a larger scale, to really uh, 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 create impact at scale and deliver cross-border value. So in the few uh, next minutes, I will talk a little bit through these steps, uh, what they include, what we imagine under each of them. So the first one is better understanding of climate risk and opportunities. So, um, there's been an enormous progress of climate risk assessment thanks to high uh, computational facility and power, thanks to Copernicus uh, program and other Earth observation programs that deliver high resolution information. We have now um, uh, large scale risk assessment models. We have a sort of community, uh, epistemological community that uh, is really characteristic in uh, looking at the climate risk. And we have achieved a lot of convergence between disaster risk reduction and climate adaptation in this field. Here we, uh, we imagine uh, there will be a European climate risk assessment framework, which is uh, inspired by the UNDRR global risk assessment framework and will be part of it. And it will include the climate adapt led by European Environment Agency and uh, the risk data hub uh, uh, developed by Disaster Risk Management Knowledge Center of the uh, GRC and other commission services. So here the research innovation will provide a lot of knowledge brokering services, including uh, uh, you know, facilitating an easy access to the data, but also a broader and better uptake of digital climate and resilient services. Now, of course, la, uh, we, uh, there's a clear understanding that the risk needs to be understood uh, from the systemic point of view, including the uh, compound and cascading effect. Mobilizing uh, uh, support, uh, we envisage a local governance structure that will steer the transformation. We will invest into inclusive deliberative processes and foster the engagement of citizens. Um, the citizens are really the core part of the mission. Uh, they, are, they will actively participate in co-designing, co-implementing and co-evaluation of, of the mission. You might have heard about citizen assemblies. La, They've been some attempts to, some countries have already uh, implemented this uh, rather innovative concept. Uh, citizen assembly is a group of people brought together to learn about and discuss issues and reach conclusions that uh, would 
typically require more time or uh, uh, that are uh, not not easy involve uh, quite important trade-offs. Uh, citizen assemblies have been uh, implemented in Ireland, France, and UK. Uh, in the UK, also for the climate actions, and uh, as an outcome, the citizen assembly um, developed a set of recommendations would how to reach uh, the net zero targets. So this is the mobilizing. It's uh, incredibly important in the context of of the of the of the mission. The visioning, uh, the visioning will include uh, la, the region will look into smart specialization strategies under the cohesion policy. They will update the smart specialization strategy to to the new version, including uh, la, uh, building up on bottom up place based uh, uh, strategic use of European structural and investment funds, next generation EU funding and additional funding. So the mission initial uh, funding is a sort of seed money and uh, this money will be leveraged by by resources from other European and regional and national programs. Uh, from the research and innovation side there will be emphasis on modeling and scenario analysis uh, providing a uh, uh, visual imagination of the possible future but also helping to monitor progress and adjust the transformative pathways. One example of this vision and pathway uh, might be the Dutch nature-based uh, future, which is shown on the right side. So you see the map of the Netherlands um, uh, last year and in 100 years, you can see there are green corridors. There is huge investment into regeneration of ecosystem and ecosystem services and uh, bioecological uh, corridors. So this type of intervention we envisage in terms of visual representation, where we want to go and how to reach that. The full step, so the mission is focusing on uh, so-called the uh, key community systems, and we have identified five of them, but uh, this is not an uh, exhaustive list. The communities and regions might include additional uh, uh, key community systems they think they are very important. And what they are, <clears throat> so first and foremost, the health and well-being, uh, probably under the ongoing pandemic, it's really uh, extremely important to improve our health services and, uh, and, and the uh, essential services that the community can fall back. Um, the second is critical community infrastructure that includes uh, the cultural institution, the green places and so on. It includes also the transport, local transport and uh, energy supply. Uh, the way how we manage water, um, that means the infrastructure for uh, water supply and sanitation, but it also includes the blue and green infrastructure. It includes uh, the way how we how we manage water and how we manage water security. Uh, the food system is land use and food food systems uh, food system in the in the whole chain of uh, of suppliers we envisage the the transformation of the food system in order to contribute to climate mitigation goals but also to reinforce the local economies and uh, and the cohesion and the core of this is uh, regeneration of ecosystem uh, investing into nature-based solutions and uh, and the restoration of ecosystem services so the fourth step will include experimentation, innovation, testing of actionable solutions, and that might include ecological corridors, um, incentive schemes for efficient use of water, climate resilient agriculture, and so on. Um, the fifth step, uh, creating impact at scale, is incredibly important. This is why, uh, where we see the impact on the ground. So it will include large-scale deployment of tested solution, transformation of the key community system in uh, in our on larger scale and an enabling condition condition uh, on governance on uh, digital infrastructure and so on that help to leverage the transformation to a larger scale so what are the demonstrators demonstrators are examples of breakthrough innovation implemented really on the ground they might include you know large scale uh, application of innovation solution uh, uh, but also something else, right? It might be soft reform, might be radical reorganization of public health, well-being services, reconfiguration of uh, social relationships uh, within the communities and the regions, 
and the uh, reforms of environmental public policies as among among many others. So this is the fifth step, and the, the finally the cross-border value is uh, is the step where we generate the EU value, where we generate really the added value to the European policies and uh, uh, reinforcing the cross-border cooperation, the transboundary cohesion, and so on. Um, so here, of course, because the the regions will have developed their visions and adaptation pathways independently, so we envisage that there will be first step to reconciliate the visions and uh, and the intervention the adaptation measures and then focus on certain uh, flagship projects and uh, uh, those flagship projects might be water abstraction allocation um, reform in the transboundary river basin protection and co uh, and connectivity of transboundary protected areas or water or air pollution control or um you know uh, coordination of uh, emergency services or anything else but this is the place where where the regions will really work closely together across the borders now this of course this transformative vision and transformative mission will require a different type of modeling and you know let's say the new generation of uh, climate adaptation uh, modeling skills, tools, and uh, and models and and methods. Uh, so to this end, uh, my organization CMCC has conducted a study for DG Klima for European Commission. Uh, part of this study was a uh, desk review of where we stand in different uh, fields of climate adaptation modeling. Uh, we have organized a, a community workshop last year in September. Um, this is the first uh, first little banner that you see on the right side and the link under the link you can see the uh, the program, the registration, the session, uh, you know, the digital library that was created in order to uh, convey the messages. And earlier this year we organized a large uh, digital event in order to uh, 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 attract attention to uh, to the new EU adaptation strategy and again we have a really uh, rich program of uh, high level policy talks and technical breakout groups where we discuss the development further and and again you can access uh, the whole digital library under the link that you can see uh, below so out of this uh, uh, comprehensive research uh, we are uh, making a recommendation of what the next generation of adaptation modeling tools should be or might be. And uh, of course, the first and uh, foremost, uh, it's incredibly important not only to know the risk, to understand the, the full implication of the climate risk, but also make the risk um, uh, uh, use that, uh, that knowledge in order to develop a actionable solution. So uh, uh, the new generation of adaptation modeling will of course focus on distributional spillover and cascading effect of climate adaptation and climate risk, um, effect on social economic fabric, on planetary health and provision of essential community services as a part of resilience. Um, these new modeling and uh, analytical skills will be closely related to the digital earth and digital twins, uh, which is um, another initiative of European Commission, DigiConnect, uh, to develop a really cloud services and high resolution digital um, replica of the earth and uh, important earth processes. And all this computing uh, facility will need to be exploited. Right. That that include you know uh, new generation of large scale hazard and risk models, uh, including high resolution exposure, um, climate and resilience services that deliver this information to the specific situation of different users. Really, that bring that knowledge and understand how to how this knowledge changes the on the ground decision and policy making, and the. Uh, and these, these modeling tools will really need to assimilate the behavioral aspect of human decision making, both in risk assessment and analysis, and to represent the complex human interaction in various social spheres. So there is a, uh, uh, we envisage a new uh, like computational social science methods like agent-based model that will enrich the existing 
climate risk assessment and management tools in order to take into account uh, the behavioral aspect and human agency and uh, translate it into a set of you know uh, drivers and levers that can really make a change in the way how we understand certain processes how we manage certain processes or how we how we interact in order to agree or reach an agreement so this is a, a short vision of the new uh, generation of adaptation modeling we will come up with a paper uh, and i'm i will be very happy to to report back next time um, till this project will will terminate uh, in summer uh, but already you can find all the resources on under the links that that i highlighted on the right side of the slide and with that i would finish and pass over to chloe thank Great. you very much Thank you so much, Jaro. Um, I just think it's really interesting to be able to see all the steps that actually lead into creating this impact and creating this value um, that you know often goes unthought about. <laughs> um, but actually, just to, add, to follow up on that and ask a couple of questions, I'm going to pass the the virtual microphone over to one of my co-conveners, Maria Helena Ramos, who's also the division president of the EGU's Hydrological Sciences Division. So Helena, do you have a question or maybe two questions to ask? Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Dr. Maiziak, for the presentation. Very interesting overview and a lot of work for uh, scientists and geoscientists for the next uh, years and even decades, I think, with all such ideas. We have uh, some questions that I would like to ask you also about um, that, that were put in the Q&R uh, box and my own questions also, of course. But first of all, Anita Di Chiara that's asking you about uh, citizens participation, the citizen assemblies that you mentioned. Uh, we would like to ask you if beyond citizens, citizen assemblies, would big industries and corporations be included also in the mission plans? Oh, absolutely. I mean, uh, uh, we all agree that uh, the change can only be achieved um, through a close collaboration between businesses, uh, citizens, uh, civil society organization, and public administrations. So I, I put the emphasis on the citizen engagement in order to make the distinction from the typical stakeholder focus, what, what we call stakeholder. Now, the, the change that we are introducing with the mission is uh, the research and the policy action really need to reach the citizens as the individual uh, you know, residents or or, 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 or stakeholder in, the, in that region. But the, the business world is absolutely on the board. Thank you very much. I think that the, the, the pandemic showed us how citizens' uh, uh, unions and uh, the way they behave is important for to go forward. Uh, my other question would be linked to your adaptation, uh, the generation of adaptation models. As a scientist, we like a lot models <laughs> and uh, doing models. And as you very well put it uh, in your presentation, we have a next generation of very powerful models nowadays. My question would be, uh, in your opinion, what, what would be the trade-offs and synergies that are still missing in these models today and that we need to explore flood further? Uh, thank you for that question. Of course, I can offer only my view on that as a scientist, as an economist, or working for 20 years in climate adaptation modeling. Um, I, I think we need to get away from the linear model of uh, knowledge deficit. Right? So, uh, for a long time before, the, I mean, all what is needed is to really improve the knowledge and make the knowledge available to, to the people that may exploited knowledge and that's it right that was the stop of uh, our job now we know that it doesn't work so the knowledge creation is really a co-production co-production with the you I, I i i really think you know the next uh, what would i really believe it's it's not a question whether we have uh, you know larger uh, model ensembles, whether we have a higher resolution of climate modeling, whether we come to a resolution of one kilometer, it will not matter if the knowledge doesn't fit, um, you know, really the um, the opportunities that a specific, uh, you know, a person or a farmer or, or business entrepreneur can do in order to exploit that knowledge. So I, I, I do really uh, believe that what, what we really need to move forward is to 
understand the value of the knowledge for specific operation and then feedback to the modeling and uh, understand how the modeling can can really produce what is really needed in order to foster certain changes of practices or specific uh, specific choices specific uh, um, uh, business innovation ideas and so on so this would be probably for me more important than investing into higher resolution of climate simulations or something really uh, first stop and uh, and talk to the users and uh, explore together how how the knowledge le, that uh, that is really wide on the ground could be co-designed and co-implemented i hope Thank that you. answer your question yeah. Yes, very well. Thank you very much. You. I think we have to move on. We have plenty of questions uh, to you yet, but I think we can pick them up in the panel. So are you handled yeah. to Chloe? Chloe, thank you. Great. Thanks so much, Helena. Um, so on to our, our next speaker, which is Claire Chenu, who will be focusing on soils in the European Green Deal. So Claire. Good morning. Good morning. So it's really a pleasure to be here in this um, mixed section between policy and science. And uh, so regarding the integration of uh, geosciences in the European Green Deal, I'm going to talk about soils and about soils in the European uh, Green uh, Deal. So the first question is, where are soils in the European Green Deal? Well, I would like to answer that they are nearly everywhere. So here you have the graph, uh, one of the schematic um, synthesizing graphs presented by the Commission to present the European uh, Green Deal. And let me show you where are soils. So you see that soils are in different places. They are, of course, like in the um, um, in alignment with the, the previous um, uh, talk in achieving climate neutrality with a climate law, preserving Europe's natural capital in the biodiversity strategy, a transition to a circular economy, a zero pollution Europe with a clean air and water action plans in the farm to fork strategy in and towards an instrument of the farm to fork, which will be a modernized and simplified cap. So soils are uh, really spread all over the um, European Green Deal. And it makes sense because soils provide many ecosystem services are, and are interacting with many challenges. One of the specificity of the Green Deal, and, and this is again a document that I extracted from the commission documents, uh, is that it provides quantitative targets. This is from the farm to fork. What you can see, just note, two. 2030, so the target, the deadline is extremely close and very ambitious targets. Reduce pesticides by 50%, for example. Um, reduce by 50% the use of antimicrobials. So very ambitious quantitative uh, targets. I will come back to that. And before I proceed, I think I should be tell you that there has been a paper already on uh, by Luca Montanarella and Panos Panagos from the GRC on the relevance of sustainable soil management within the European uh, Green Deal. And indeed, the main topic is not only the, how our soils in the Green Deal, but how is sustainable soil management accounted for and used in the Green Deal. Let me first explain to you what is sustainable soil management. Sustainable soil management has been defined by the FAO and soil management is sustainable if the supporting, provisioning, regulating and cultural services provided by soils are maintained or enhanced without significantly impairing either the soil functions that enable those services or biodiversity. Soil management is sustainable if soils can remain multifunctional. This is extremely important, even for agricultural soils. I'm working and I will present you a program I'm working on agricultural soils. Now, there's, we are using the soil science community with the concept of soil quality, the capacity of soils to perform their functions. Now, there is a concept that is developing a lot in the European Commission documents. It's the one of soil health. Soil health is defined as the continued capacity of soils to provide ecosystem services. So you see, well, there's a lot of discussion, of course, on these concepts, quality, health, but you see that if soil is sustainably managed, 
it should become healthy. While the present situation is more than, is that more uh, recent assessment is that more than 60% of European soils are not healthy. Now, the European Green Deal is not the only policy uh, not the only initiative dealing with soils. Actually, there's a whole, um, the landscape is fairly rich. Well, the European Commission has launched a consultation for the new EU soil strategy. So you can answer, you have until Tuesday. Uh, you can answer as citizens, you can answer as scientists, as groups. Uh, there's also a mission. Um, concerning soils, and the mission uh, initial title was to uh, healthy soils uh, and food, and it has been renamed caring for soil is caring for life. So these are, of course, strongly related to the Green Deal, but there's also in the landscape the Four Per Meal, the international Four Per Meal initiative, Soils for Food Security and Climate, promoting the preservation and the increase of soil organic carbon stocks and soil organic matter. And there is also the Global Soil Partnership, which was at the origin of this definition of sustainable soil management. So there's a series of initiatives, and luckily they are very consistent. Do not have may, may, maybe the same targets quantitatively, but it all goes on the same way. So <laughs> let me, so in my second part, let me now, I will, like to take a few examples, and I will only take three examples on how our soils present in the Green Deal, and actually with two questions. What is, what can we say about the effect the Green Deal will have on soils, if it's realized, if it's implemented, and what is the contribution of soils to the Green Deal, and does soil management contribute to uh, achievement of the Green Deal. And so I will take three examples in three different strategies. First example is the biodiversity strategy. Biodiversity strategy, um, quantitative target is, uh, well, they have several, but one of them is let's increase uh, by 10% landscape features by 2030. Again, ambitious. Um, so what is behind? landscape features, buffer strips, hedges, fallow land, non-productive trees left in the middle of um, crops, terrace walls, ponds. So you see, uh, yes, it has consequences on, on soil, of course. It doesn't need soil to be implemented, but it does have consequences on soils and actually does have really benefits on soils. And this is widely documented that these landscape features tend to reduce soil erosion, to increase water infiltration, to reduce nitrogen and phosphorus losses, to increase soil organic carbon stocks, to increase soil biodiversity. So here, soils clearly benefit from the Green Deal if the Green Deal is, if this is implemented, if this target is reached. Now, are there still related knowledge needs? Yes, of course. Two examples, connectivity at the landscape scale and erosion. So not working only at the plot scale, but working at the landscape scale. And what is the actual effect on soils biodiversity of these different landscape features? So here we have one arrow from uh, the Green Deal to soils. Let's take another example. In the farm to fork strategy, what is planned, what is uh, targeted is to reduce the use of fertilizers by 2030 by 20%, and to reduce nutrient excess. Well, you know that we have a awful natural and phosphorus excesses by 50% by the same time. Here, the benefits to soil, the direct benefits to soil, for example, for reducing nitrogen, mineral nitrogen uh, fertilizers uh, application is well known again, it is to reduce soil acidification. Uh, but I would say, but besides there's no, um, yes, there's um, effects are mainly indirect because if you want to reach those targets, you must use soil management. You must try to avoid nutrient losses, integrated nutrient management, rotations, cover crops, agroforestry, precision agriculture, 
try to improve the provision of nutrients by soil if you reduce the external application by increasing soil organic matter content, by using mycorrhiza, legumes, and try also to substitute mineral with organic fertilizers. These management options, so this is soil management indeed, and this has consequences on soil. These management options tend to increase organic matter by diversity, uh, improve soil structure. So again, here you see that soil management and sustainable, this is sustainable soil management, is needed for the achievement of this uh, European Green Deal target, and it will benefit to soils. Again, uh, new research uh, re knowledge needs, of course, there's uh, knowledge needs in terms of knowledge development about uh, nutrient that, for example, nutrient dynamics and cycles in agroforestry, about soil uh, stoichiometry and the consequences on uh, soil organic carbon sequestration on soil biodiversity. So there's still our research, yes, knowledge needs to be able to um, really assess how to implement those management options and what are the consequences. Let's go now to my third example. So the climate law, Europe becomes climate neutral in 2050. It has uh, just been presented, extremely ambitious um, indeed. And uh, it is known that this will require negative emission technologies, storage of carbon in soils. But more widely, this has to go for the part of soils through protecting existing soil organic carbon stocks in forests, in permanent grassland, and essentially in peatland, to increasing soil organic carbon stocks. And here, what is targeted is essentially degraded soils and agricultural soils, and reducing N2O emissions. And here, um, the main actors, uh, unfortunately, are agricultural soils. So this is the general uh, target. And actually, there are other targets um, out there. Uh, the mission board, uh, on soils, caring for soils is caring for life, has proposed a target that the current carbon concentration losses on cultivated land, which is 0.5% per year in average in Europe, should be reversed and be increased up to 0.1 to 0.4%. Uh, and this is actually the same target that is in the 4 per mil initiative. Well, wait, is it, it's an aspirational target, but it's the same order of magnitude. And also the second target in the emission board is to reduce that the area of managed peatland um, losing carbon is reduced by um, 30 to 50%, very ambitious again. So yes, we have targets of the Green Deal, but we have additional ones in other initiatives. Now, let me go to the same kind of, um, Yes, presentation. So how here soils are involved in that soil management is needed if we want to achieve this objective of um, um, soils contributing uh, to uh, negative emission technologies, contributing to increasing soil organic carbon stocks. There's a wide range of soil management options that um, exist for that. And I should have added land uses, of course, uh, afforestation, for example. Uh, these are known, there's a lot of quantitative estimates. Um, what is known also is that it benefits to soil. So these management options that are needed for the Green Deal are sustainable management options They will benefit. So soil will be an actor and soil will benefit from. Again, knowledge needs, for example, the drivers of soil organic carbon persistence, uh, the effects of not only um, uh, forestry or agricultural practices, but also agricultural systems, forestry systems, urban systems, food systems have a more integrated view. This is really needed. And also, very important question, the trade-offs between soil organic carbon storage and to emissions and more generally nitrogen and phosphorus losses. So there's, we have a lot of knowledge out there, we still need. And another still on this, uh, on the climate law, um, I would like to show you two results. I'm, so I'm coordinating this European joint program soil and we asked or what we decided is to survey, to do a stock take of which countries had already made an estimate of their technical potential of carbon storage in agricultural soil. How much my country can store additional carbon in agricultural soils? 
this is the graph showing the results. Um, and what came out is that only 13 countries had done it. You have the initials of the country there. And some of them had done it in, with only one practice. For example, Italy with only compost, Spain with only no tillage, while um, Sweden, for example, or France had implemented, well, conceptually modeled the effect of different uh, management options. And well, you can see from the numbers that potentially it can amount to quite um, an important contribution to redu reducing the emissions from the agricultural sector. So what we are doing now in the AJP is that 23 countries have agreed to do an estimate of the carbon storing potential in agricultural soils using a harmonized methodology. So this is different 23 countries collaborating to, towards this. Now, this is the technical potential, but if you consider the price of this additional stored carbon, you can see that the, the uh, economical potential is less than the technical potential. And the only one of these uh, 13 studies had, has an economical uh, study uh, coupled with it, and it's the, the uh, study by Pellerin, Bamir et al. And what about what is socially acceptable, what is practically implemented, because the knowledge is there, um, the uh, enabling conditions are there. Well, I have no example to give you. We really lack estimates on the economy and on the social, legal, etc. Uh, okay, so I'm going to um, the end. So what I there, I, you see, there are uh, souls are really present in the Green Deal, both as actors of the Green Deal, but also as beneficiaries of the Green Deal. Now, regarding knowledge needs, I have presented you knowledge needs that are in the category of knowledge development. And as um, was previously uh, said, what actually is also needed and actually to implement really um, a better management of soils in Europe is we need what is needed is to monitor soil functions and their contribution to ecosystem services, then to have indicators, indicators that absolute, must absolutely be context dependent. So this is a very active area of knowledge development, but also not only development, also assemblage, putting together, integrating the knowledge, intercomparing. And one thing that is absolutely important that is really crucial is to harmonize the soil information. We have different methods across Europe in the different countries uh, for measuring even soil organic carbon content. So there's a need for harmonization and there's a need of harmonization so that the way also the information is stored so that it can be shared in research program, it can be extended, it can be shared and used for policy because it's enough harmonized. There's a need for measuring, reporting and verifying on soils, not only on soil carbon, but also on all the soil characteristics. And there's a crucial need for fair and functional incentives to uh, help the, pro the stakeholders to implement the management options. Now, the examples I took so far are essentially knowledge development uh, needs. And I agree knowledge has to be as much as possible co-construction. Uh, between stakeholders and scientists. But we do not only need knowledge development, we also need knowledge sharing and transfer, uh, um, sharing with stakeholders, with citizens, uh, making uh, the information available, usable by policymakers, for example. Um, and this is an engaging, uh, engaging with the society and scientists are needed there. There's also a need, as I just said, on knowledge harmonization, organization and, and, and storage, databases, monitoring, um, monitor, uh, monitoring soils, um, having sharing observatories, national observatories, European observatories. And there's a need for knowledge application. Well, you can think, of course, of living labs, of lighthouses farm, as pro proposed in the mission, but also uh, policy support for policy. Um, knowledge driven policy. And I think that now um, about geosciences and scientists, well, the engagements of scientists can be in these different sections of the knowledge framework. So this is the knowledge framework we are using in our uh, European program that is named toward soil, towards climate smart and sustainable management of soils. And from that, I would like to conclude that soils play a central role in the European Green Deal. That's 
and that's a fantastic opportunity for geoscientists. There's a lot to do in terms of knowledge development, sharing and transfer, harmonization, uh, organization, and application. And thank you for your attention. Thanks so much, Claire. Um, so you've actually answered in that presentation, you answered a lot of the questions that I had. Oh, sorry. Um, no, 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 it's great. It's great. And and you actually already uh, preemptively answered one of the questions in the Q&A as well. So bonus points there. Um, but I am going to pass over to my co-convener, co -convener, uh, Claudio Zacona, who is also the EGU's uh, division president on the Soil System Sciences Division, um, to, an to ask one of his questions. Thank you. Thanks, Claire. Thanks, Claire. I mean, uh, I have to say that I always enjoy to attend your presentation. They are always extremely interesting, clear, and so on. So I have two very simple questions. So uh, what are the issues or the limitations that we as geoscientists or soil scientists face when communicating soil-related issues and potential solution? Uh, I would say on soils, uh, one of the issues is that soils are a collective unknown. Uh, no one knows about soil and it's perceived as being not very attractive. So I think that there's work needed on making on raising awareness on making soils uh, more likable, uh, more known. Uh, so that's on the, the one hand. And on the other hand, um, what I feel is that we still are so much in the top-down scheme. We still are so much as scientists because we have made our studies, we have begun to work like that, that um, science and my predecessors say the same, science finds solutions and then hands the solutions to the stakeholders, which is completely true, completely, uh, it doesn't work. It doesn't work. And so we need to learn how to, um, how to work in co-construction, this very nice word, very sexy, but okay, what is co-construction? Where, where do you co-construct? Is it co-constructing the ideas, the priorities of research? I think it is. I think it is also at this very early stage and not only the implementation in the ground. So yes, I would say awareness and learn to go to another scheme that is co-construction. Okay, Claire, the last one, I mean, we, you, I mean, you told several times that soil play a central role in the European Green Deal. So my question is, is there some soil related field that is still missing in the European Green Deal? Hmm. Um, I don't... Well, I don't know. I don't know because, I, to be honest, I have not read all the communications of the Green Deal. <laughs> I have read the biodiversity and the farm to fork one, but I have not read all. Uh, well, I wonder whether urban soils are present enough. Um, I wonder. There's a lot of uh, focus put on agriculture, and this is meaningful because we have many environmental, environmental problems where agriculture is both the uh, are the origin of the problem, but also a solution. Uh, but I wonder whether there's enough focus on urban uh, territories and peri-urban zones. Well, and yes, I wonder, and I don't, yes, about land take. Land take is a huge problem, sealing, salt sealing and land take. I don't know. Um, and thank you for the question, because I'll, I'll have a look uh, whether it's taken up. And, and to, you know, to deal with land take, uh, to deal with, um, behind line tech is how do we, um, is the whole issue of land planning and urbanization. And this requires uh, interdisciplinary work and work with stakeholders. Yes, and also, yes, one measure that I, I wanted to conclude on soul must, uh, soul scientists must interact with other scientists and other disciplines, but well, okay, I'll take the opportunity of the question. Thanks, Claire. Yeah, thanks Thank also you. for... Thanks from my side. So now I'm going to pass directly over to our third speaker, Joe Eisen, um, to give us a very different perspective on some of the lessons from previous EU biodiversity and forest interventions in Africa and the conditions for an equitable and sustainable Natura Africa, which is one of the initiatives. So, Joe. 
Thanks very much, Chloe, and uh, good morning, everybody, and thanks thanks for inviting me along. Um, it's very nice to uh, to hop and with scientists. Uh, it's a very very different webinar that I uh, that I normally attend. So thanks thanks very much for that. Um, yeah, so I, I I'm just going to give uh, um, quite a short presentation um, looking at how the EU Green Deal intersects um, with with the European Union's international interventions. Um, particularly um, uh, one that's being touted and currently being being developed called Natura Africa. Um, I've I've entitled it uh, "Keeping Full Solutions Out of uh, Natura Africa" because um, there's there's a fairly long line of 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 difficult um, projects that the EC has supported uh, in Africa that I think we will do very well to to avoid moving forward. Um, so a bit about me. I'm I'm the executive director of of the Rainforest Foundation UK. Um, so who are we? What do we do? Uh, very quickly, uh, we support uh, indigenous peoples and local communities of the world's rainforests in their efforts to protect their environment and to fill their their rights to land, life, and livelihood. Um, our core our core belief as an organisation is that you can only achieve environmental protection if uh, human rights and land rights are recognised. Uh, we've been around for 30 years. Um, we were actually established by by the singer Sting in 1989, um, but we're we're mainly active in in the Congo recent, Congo Basin region of of Africa. Um, but we also work in in West Africa and and Peru. And and how we work, we work through very long term partnerships with with civil society groups, indigenous peoples in the country to ensure that capacity is stayed sustained where it's needed. Um, just a very quick overview of some of the EU programs in in Central Africa, just to lay a bit of the foundation uh, for the presentation. So. Um, there's lots, of course. Uh, Africa is an extremely important uh, continent, the most important continent in many ways uh, for for Europe. Um, there's and there's various different initiatives aim, aimed at enhancing uh, natural resource governance and um, forest governance. But one of them uh, is called the FLECT VPA agreements. So FLECT FLECT. Uh, if you don't know this already, uh, is, is is an acronym for Forest Law Enforcement, Governance and Trade. And it's essentially um, an initiative which seeks to develop bilateral uh, agreements between uh, timber producing countries in Africa and across the world uh, with with the EC to to to, have to, to create uh, timber licenses, to create timber licenses um, to um, export uh, well-managed timber into the European markets. Um, that's that, that's been around for around 12 years, and it's I think it's been about a billion euros spent on it worldwide. Um, recently, there's 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 been a very welcome development at the European policy level uh, to develop a law on imported deforestation um, to make sure that timber that enters European markets is is um, um, sound. So yeah, there's this um, uh, law on imported deforestation um, that that's being developed, and that's that, that that's a very welcome initiative. Um, finally, um, one of the biggest EU programs in Africa um, has been to develop, expand, and manage a system of strictly protected areas, particularly through the EcoPack program. Um, it's it's it, it's a program that the EC has invested hundreds of millions of dollars in, and it's about creating um, strictly protected protected areas um, that are often treated as as wildernesses that you know should be protected, um, and that's that, that's been funded by the EcoPack program. Um, so that's just a very quick uh, uh, overview of some of the main EU interventions in Africa. Um, but now now moving forward, um, the EU Green Deal um, proposes to, to to set up this new program, Natura Africa. And again, the, the, the aim is to expand and consolidate a network of protected areas and, and, and offer opportunities to, to, to support green development for local communities. Um, now, what does this mean in practice? So, so um, I, I guess you're aware of the post-2020 biodiversity framework. 
um, that is currently being negotiated and is due to be finalised at the COP15 in Kuming uh, in this, this October. And um, the EU has some very clearly stated goals in relation to this, um, including that it, it hopes that the overarching global goals for biodiversity um, uh, are established by, by 2050 and very ambitious global uh, 3030 targets uh, in line with the EU strategy, the EU biodiversity strategy. Essentially what that means is that the, uh, at, at the EC level, there is a goal to, to declare 30% of, of Europe uh, uh, as, as protected areas. Um, and there is um, uh, efforts at the global level to make the 30% target um, a reality across the world. And um, so this, 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 this came from an initial concept note that the, East, that the EC developed uh, for Natura Africa. And, and again, it very clearly describes that, that a protected area model is, 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 is the way to achieve um, biodiversity goals through, through Natura Africa. Um, but I just wanna um, take a second to, to see, I mean, I think as an organization that works very closely with local and indigenous communities in Africa, uh, there, there is a risk that, that this program could entrench past, past failures. Um, so as an organization, we, we, we do lots of field work with indigenous communities uh, on the ground. Um, we've, uh, we've noticed many uh, social problems linked to these protected areas. And, and a couple of years ago, we got funding at last to, to, to look at this issue more, system, more systematically, to look at what the social impacts and actually what the biodiversity impacts of these protected areas are across the Congo Basin. So we, we studied um, a, a group of uh, 35 protected areas. There's about 200 in the, in the Central African region um, to, to look at this. And, and what we found was there was very scant evidence that these, these kinds of, of protected areas ever consulted um, you know, forest dependent people that live and depend on this resource. Um, we found that I think in 26 of the 35 protected areas, um, there were reports of physical or economic placement of local and indigenous communities. Um, there were numerous reports of, of conflicts by, by eco guards, armed park rangers that are charged with, with managing the, um, uh, the uh, managing and protecting these areas. So there were 21 conflicts um, and there were six, six cases where there, there was no reports, uh, no data reported. So um, as you can see, the protected areas uh, across the region are having very severe impacts on, on local and, and indigenous communities. And one of the things that came out of the research that we weren't particularly expecting was, was they, they were of questionable, um, biodiversity uh, effectiveness as well. There was very little empirical evidence that, that keystone species were, um, were better protected in these areas. Um, you know, biodiversity and mega, megafauna is in, in, is in steep decline in many parts of Central Africa. Um, there's a lack of community driven projects um, which have proven effective um, elsewhere. Um, and of course, um, these kinds of protected areas are under threat from, from extractive industries. So this, this is a model of um, protected areas that has been supported by the EC, not just the EC, but also you know, the US government and, and the German government in particular uh, for a long time. And it's, it's based on this kind of notion that, that, that tropical forests are wildernesses. But through our work in supporting indigenous communities to map these areas, what we actually know, these are actually very much human landscapes. And, and by separating nature uh, and, and humans, uh, you you leave to, you know you you lead to very perverse outcomes socially, uh, economically, and and in biodiversity terms as well. So just to give a couple of examples, and and, and one or two of these are uh, have been funded by the EC uh, Ecofact program. So this is this is a strictly protected area, Tumbalindima, that was that was created in 2006 in in Western DR Congo. Um, the 
it was created again without any consultation uh, of, of the local and indigenous communities um, that live and depend on this resource. And what you can see here, these, these white polygons, um, these, these are customary uh, tenure systems. So these are clan parcels. These, these, are, these, these, these are how the, ma the land is customarily owned and managed by, by, by local people. There's, there's 120,000 people that live in this area and overnight uh, a protected area was created um, and it's led to all sorts of land conflicts, um, human rights abuses, conflict between the, the, um, the local communities and, and the park managers. Uh, another case from the DR Congo, the, the Salonga National Park, which is a World Heritage Site. Uh, we, we have supported local communities and local civil society organizations there to, to support human rights monitoring uh, of, of the relationship between the armed eco guards and, and local communities. We, we only studied uh, 12 out of 600 communities that are impacted by the park. Um, and we found mass reports of very, very serious human rights violations. Um, so yeah, it's 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 a pervasive problem, and um, it's um, it it very much um, needs to change. And I think I think the international community now um, are starting to come to terms that treating rainforest as wildernesses is, 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 is detrimental. Um, there's been various legal reforms at the US government as a result of this campaign um, to, to design conservation programs that are more pro-poor, uh, more, participa more participatory and inclusive. Um, there's, there's, there, there's been questions certainly asked at the European uh, Parliament level, but that, that really hasn't uh, cascaded down to, to um, the kind of policy making level. I mean, as we saw from, from, from the document I showed earlier in the presentation about Natura Africa, the mode, you know, the, the go to uh, um, model is still strictly protected areas, and I think that needs to change. Um, another thing, just to just, just a flag about EU policy and well, global policy in relation to, to uh, rainforest conservation um, moving forward. Uh, uh, um, I think uh, I think it was Jaroslav that talked about nature-based solutions in 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 Europe, um, but I think particularly in in places like Africa and other tropical forest regions, I think we need to um, uh, throw a, a word of caution about the climate mitigation potential of, of nature-based solutions. Um, a, lot, a lot of the policy development at the moment is based on one single paper by, by Griscom, which, which estimated that 35, um, that, that uh, nature-based solutions represent 35% of climate mitigation potential within the next 10 years. Um, now that's that's quite a claim, I think. Um, in order to in order to do that, you would need an area the size of Australia. Uh, you would need to map it. You would need to you know you need to consult all the local communities who who may claim this land. Um, it may be done through potentially environmentally destructive plantations, uh, which have their own ecological impacts. Um, so I think we we need to be careful about about inflating. The, the, the potential of nature-based solutions to as a climate mitigation tool, particularly, and obviously ad, ad, adaptation more so. Um, and it's interesting that a lot of you know the oil companies uh, are very much behind this com are very much behind this concept. Um, so you have you know Total, uh, Shell, Eni, and and the like that are very much behind this this movement. And and of course that you know that already uh, starts the alarm bells ringing. So I think it's just important that. Um, the EU Green Deal abroad doesn't place too much emphasis on on unproven things that that, that delay climate action in 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 Europe in the global north. So just to finish off, um, so what are the conditions to to for the EU grill to avoid entrenching past failures in Africa? But as I said, I think you know um, the recognition of indigenous peoples and community land tenure is an absolute prerequisite. Um, it's not just about social justice; it's also about it's also about um, environmental uh, effectiveness as well. 
Um, and, you know, there's a lot of scientific research which shows that areas under the control of such groups are better managed, um, better social and economic outcomes. And I think that needs to be supported in, in, in policy terms. Uh, all future projects really need to uphold the, the principle of the free prior and obtaining the free prior and informed consent of, of local communities that are impacted by, by these interventions. Too, too often, uh, international funding has, has gone from, uh, you know, the big international governments uh, to the big international NGOs um, bypassing African civil society. And you're not going to change anything unless you really work with and empower African civil society to play its role. Um, again, going back to, to being wary about nature-based solutions and other offset schemes that, that, that delay climate action in Europe. Um, net zero is not zero um, and we need to be really con conscious uh, around that narrative because we you know we, we, we don't have much of a carbon bu budget left um, and we can't allow the system to be gained gained and yeah in the, in the spirit of the other presentations you know how can we embed geoscience in rights-based approaches one of the things we do as an organization we campaign for you know um african civil society organizations to campaign for laws which 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 give communities rights to their lands and resources how can we work with such groups to 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 ensure that you know having land tenure um can deliver um benefits to local communities as 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 well as environmental benefits so yeah just as a last slide um Giving control to local and indigenous communities secures um, and securing land rights and building local capacity reduces le less deforestation, more carbon stored, human rights upheld, and improved livelihoods. And I think I think that Natura Africa really needs to sort of uh, take a, a long, hard look at the theory of change about how we're going to um, make a positive change uh, in Africa. Uh, so, yeah, thanks. Thanks very much for taking the time to listen to me and I look forward to any questions you may have. Great. Thank you so much, Joe, um, for giving us as scientists the perspective that we often don't hear um, or, or, or think about. Um, now, I can say that our fourth and final speaker has joined us. Welcome, Diedrich Sampson. But we, before we do get to our final speaker, um, I'm just going to pass quickly over to my co-convener, Ned. Uh, Sadiland, who was also one of the authors of the EGU's publication on how geoscience can support the Green, uh, the green Deal. So, Ned, do you have a, a question or maybe two questions for Joe? Oh, yeah. Yeah, of course. And thanks, Joe. That was a really, really interesting talk. I just I clearly had time for two questions. So the first one was um, in line with what you were talking about and uh, the response of uh, Nature Africa and some of the issues that you brought up, I understand that you, alongside some other NGOs, have written to the EU. Do you feel like you're having a positive back and forth with them? And I guess I can probably combine that into my second question, which was going to be, do you feel the um, viewpoint of NGOs are being brought in as much as they can uh, into the EU Green Deal and the decisions that they're making currently? I know there's the Life 2020 uh, initiative to try and bring in proposals from NGOs to be involved but do you do you feel like that back and forth is going the direction you would want and if not what do you think is the best way to achieve that thanks ned yeah it's a really good question i mean i i would say you know the the concept around natura africa was was developed um um without any consultation of of international ngos working in 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 human rights and and conservation and certainly not without any consultation of, of African civil society organizations. So, you know, I think, um, I think you know, us, us and other NGOs kicked up a bit of a stink um, about the program and, 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 and we're hopeful they are, they are reconsidering it. Um, but that, that very much you know, remains, remains to be seen. Um, you know, human rights uh, is, is, is not always properly embedded in their programs. So I would say to that question, it's very much a work in progress, Ned. All right. So um, I guess that brings us on to our fourth speaker, who is Diedrich Samson. 
Now, Diedrich is a Dutch environmentalist who led the Labour Party from 2012 until 2016. Before his election to Parliament, he was CEO of a green energy company and campaigner for green peace in the Netherlands. Since November 2019, he has worked as the head of cabinet for first vice president of the European Commission, Frans Timmermans. And subsequently, he has played a very important role in the creation and implementation of the Green Deal. So welcome, Diedrich. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, oh, hold, hold on. Can you hear me? Yes. <laughs> that was, that's always nice. Well, it took me a while to get into this Zoom meeting. After one year of this, you should know. You should think yeah, you get uh, better at it, but the usual trouble. So I joined late, um, and I will be brief, uh, so that we have all the time for questions and answers and whatever. Um, and first of all, I wanted to congratulate all of you with your marvelous work. Uh, and uh, that's more than just courtesy. Uh, I do that because I need you uh, a lot in what we are doing with the Green Deal. Because to step back a bit from daily uh, business, let's look at that Green Deal. What is it actually? It is not a normal environmental plan like you've seen dozens of coming from Brussels in the last decade. It's much more than that. Uh, the Green Deal stands out from, let's say, normal environmental plans in at least three ways. Um, one of them is obviously its ambition. For once, politicians didn't go for the lowest common denominator, for the feasible, for the practical. No, for once, politicians uh, set settle for that what was necessary getting ourselves to a fully sustainable society before half of the century hence the climate neutrality goal uh, and the minus 50 50 uh, uh, in 2030 that we just agreed the climate law on to enshrine that into legislation to show actually ourselves but also the rest of the world that we are damn serious about it real ambition needed because obviously the urgency at hand is clear and that's what you scientists tell us every day. The second thing is, the second difference with normal environmental ideas and plans is that for once we didn't make a plan on climate and then another one on energy and then another one on nature and then something on transport and then something on water, discovering halfway that some of those plans work against each other. No, we made a co comprehensive, coherent, idea, vision to save our ecosystem. Um, and basically, come to think of it, that's pretty logical to make one idea about our ecosystem because there is only one ecosystem. And within that ecosystem, everything is connected with everything else too. So our plans, our strategies should be connected with each other too. So we didn't go only for that climate neutrality goal, but also for the goal to stop the loss of biodiversity completely and also the ambition to stop the further pollution of water, soil, and air. We have polluted enough in the last two centuries, or actually more longer than that. Um, so a coherent idea in order to get ourselves to this ultimate ambition a fully sustainable society, including also the ideas to become fully circular, because you cannot become fully sustainable if your economy is still a linear one throwing away all the stuff that you used at the end of the game. And the third way that our Green Deal stands out from normal environmental plans is that it is actually not an environmental plan. It is a growth strategy. And coming from the environmental movement myself, I vividly remember that when we presented it uh, almost one and a half years ago now in December 2019, that idea of an environmental strategy being a growth plan raised some eyebrows, especially within the environmental community, because how on earth can you combine those huge uh, environmental objectives with the idea of a further growing economy? I do think that is possible. I also think it's needed to combine the two. Uh, and I'm now more than ever happy that we did before, because this is all ha this was all happened uh, in the pre-corona era. So three months into the plan, March 2020, 
we were hit by something that turned our world upside down and that's the reason why we speak to each other on these stupid screens all the time uh, but it did much more than that it also deflected a lot of the political capital uh, political attention and maybe also the financial capital and that happens before in 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 history when politicians finally muster the courage to put a long-term vision on uh, on, on paper to put a dot on the horizon and tell the public that we were going in that direction. Once that happens, sometimes, or actually most of the time, something urgently comes by, wipes away the, the long-term vision and takes all the attention to the urgency at hand. I remember vividly that we had that in 2009 when politicians in Europe had embarked on a climate ambition after Al Gore mesmerized us all with his movie An Inconvenient Truth. And just as that has happened, Lehman Brothers fell. And we do dove into the financial crisis and we haven't heard about An Inconvenient Truth ever since. This time was different, luckily. <laughs> this time was different because we realized pretty soon into the COVID pandemic that we needed a growth strategy to get our ourselves out of this mess, out of this economic crash that the corona crisis uh, brought us upon. Um, and here we were looking for a growth strategy while well, the European Commission had just produced one. The, it was called the Green Deal. So instead of what I feared would happen, and many of us feared what will happen, that the Green Deal would be put in the lowest drawer that you could find, the deepest drawer that you can find never uh, to come back again, we put the Green Deal on steroids in order to fight back economically from this pandemic. We said, well, if we have to build back, we better build back green because it makes no sense to restore your economy and then again transfer transition it to a sustainable green economy. Do it once, uh, do it uh, right in the first instance. So here we are with the Green Deal on steroids, um, the plans being put on the table, some of them in more, uh, also a more detailed form. We plan to come halfway of the year, somewhere the beginning of July maybe, with our so-called Fit for 55 package, which is the whole legislation to get ourselves, first of all, to minus 55 CO2 emissions and then to climate uh, neutrality in 2050. But we need you. Uh, we need science for that because, well, it was already alluded to. I just uh, followed the last part of the preceding uh, presentation. Um, part of the ambition uh, is reducing the emissions. Part of the ambition is also increasing the removals, increasing the way we sequester carbon in our soil, in our trees, in everything we do. Uh, and uh, we need a lot of science to make that happen. We also need a lot of science to make the emissions reduce, etc. We need um, the businesses and Elon Musk type of, of, of entrepreneurs to get us into new technology, etc. But we also need, and more than we ex actually thought, and more than we paid attention to so far, those nature-based solutions that can stabilize our ecosphere. Not only in climate terms, because the good part of nature-based solutions is that it also helps the other aims that we were striving for saving biodiversity or stopping the loss of biodiversity, increase, um, stopping our pollution, cleaning our air, cleaning our soil, cleaning our water. We need those nature-based solutions. Uh, and that's why we need your knowledge. And we need to know what we are actually doing. And that's also why we need your knowledge. Because there's a, uh, I now, well, I'm pretty new to the European Commission, but I'm I'm amazed by the amount of data that is flowing around and that we actually arguing about. We arguing with the member states on how much forest they actually put there or how much forest they took away uh, for well, several reasons sometimes. How much land they have actually in use in, for farming or for other non-agricultural uh, practices. Um, and we arguing with them on those data while at the same time we looking from space down on earth with breathtaking precision and we actually could know what they're doing without asking them 
uh, directly without exchanging all kinds of papers and, and protocols and frameworks and data. We just take a picture. Um, and well, you know better than I do that just taking a picture is not that easy. Uh, you, need, you, need to load, you need to know a truckload of things about what you're looking at, actually. And that's why we need you too. So we need science, we need geoscientists for bringing us closer to the, the best nature-based solutions because you can screw up quite a lot if you don't know what you're doing. And we need, to, we need you in order to see, to help us see what we are actually achieving in order to learn those lessons, in order to bring us step by step towards minus 55 and then to climate neutrality, the end goal uh, that we all striving for, not because it's a number on paper, because but because we want to look our kids right into the eye somewhere in the next two decades, um, that we are actually not screwing up their future, but that we are helping them. So all in all, I think there's a union to make between uh, the politicians and the other people working on the Green Deal from a technical, political, financial part and the scientist community that can tell us what we're doing and how we should do it. With that, I hand over to you. Fantastic, thank you so much, Diedrich. It was really great for our scientists to hear something along those lines as well, I'm sure, knowing that they can get engaged if they, if they want to. Um, I do have a follow-up question before we do get into the broader panel discussion. And that is that the Green Deal is obviously going to have um, a lot of you know, large societal positive impacts um, that will subsequently also benefit scientists. But are there some specific activities that are supported by the Green Deal that are also likely to benefit those scientists or benefit research in general? Yes, it does. Um, and actually, before the Green Deal was, was put on paper formally, you could already see that momentum changing. And I'm referring to the so-called Horizon missions. And we have that huge research program, which we call Horizon, appropriate name. Uh, and we, we, well, we've been struggling with how to frame and organize that for the last decades. And the latest development is those missions that we think bring science closer to people or the other way around uh, to uh, societal challenges. And four of those missions are actually directly related to climate science. It's about uh, soils, it's about uh, oceans, it's about adaptation, uh, it's, it's about clean cities, um, and there's one about cancer, which is equally important, by the way, but not related uh, to climate change. So I think uh, we, we aligned uh, the, the Horizon program more towards well, the Green Deal objectives, even before the Green Deal was there. So that's nice uh, coincidence. Obviously, what we should do next uh, is also strengthen those missions, not only aligning it, but increasing them also in terms of finances. And that's where we always hit a snack uh, because the commission proposes quite a lot of investments into uh, research. And then the European Council, 27 members, uh, prime ministers, in all their wisdom, decide to cut back on that a little more because they don't want to spend that much money. This is something that happens every four, uh, seven years and it happened again. Uh, nevertheless, quite a lot of money left. 100 billion, I, I don't have it in my pocket every day. Uh, and, but mo the most important part, so the, re the alignment, the strengthening in terms of finance. But as I said, what we now need more is the alliance, uh, the alliance between the people working from one side, which is the Bellamon building and that incredible machinery, uh, the, the European Commission, and also in member states, politicians, the civil servants, together with the scientists. I do think that we're entering a new era in which that connection, which is not self-evident at all, is made better every day. And uh, it's my commitment to increase that over the years towards a full alliance between science and politics. Well, I hope so too. <laughs> um, everyone here knows I'm a little bit biased towards that because I'm the EG's policy officer. But um, 
I, I do I do have uh, one more question to you, but actually I think it's one that the whole panel will want to address as well. So I think I'm actually going to open this up to the panel discussion starting from now. Um, but I, I'm actually going to be a little bit greedy and kick off this panel discussion with my own question, <laughs> which is... Uh, Okay, we've talked a little bit already about what scientists can do in terms of supporting the Green Deal throughout throughout the last hour. Um, but specifically now, what in what can scientific unions such as the EGU do to support these scientists or more generally support the connection between scientists and policymakers um, and therefore support the Green Deal and how and the ambitious targets that it has? And Deidre, I'm gonna start with you because you're on my screen right now, but I'm then going to pass it off to the other panelists as well. But I'm, I'm going to quickly pass it on because this is a question for, for yourself, eh, for how you organize yourself as a scientific community uh, towards us. So I have something to say about it, but I'm, I'm going to say as little as possible. As I said, I, I, we are receptive, at least it's my commitment to become more receptive, uh, but how your union can help the individual scientists or the individual scientific uh, groups, uh, that's something for you to answer. And I hope you will be successful in that. So I pass on this question to the, the other panelists. Okay, great. So other panelists, I see Claire puts her hand up. Claire, you, I'll allow you to jump in here. To unmute myself, hello. Um, yeah, thank you for uh, um, giving me the opportunity. Well, I think uh, unions can do a lot, scientific unions can do a lot. Well, first by organizing uh, sessions at conferences like that. Uh, and I think many, quite often, scientists would like to know about policy, but it's much better, yes. So uh, conferences are a good, um, I think, way to well, to make these exchanges and to, well, to learn, to learn about policies. And also, I think that the scientific community and unions can represent a task force. Uh, what I see in the European program I am coordinating is that we are able to answer to, uh, or in the FOPM initiative, we are able, to, for example, to answer to questionnaires uh, from the commission on the mission on the soft strategy in a coordinated way because we can assemble the the answers while well, stimulate their answers and have group uh, group work so having elaborated answers when um, when the commission or other bodies uh, uh, ipcc or other ask for so promote and organize the task force of scientists contributing to global efforts Great, thank you, Claire. Um, I can see Yaro also has his hand up. Oh, thank you very much. Um, you know, looking at the uh, EGU directly, you have a, a number of you know very interesting divisions, uh, but they are somehow uh, disciplinary uh, oriented. Unless, uh, would it make sense for EGU to create a division that is cross disciplinary and addressing climate resilience across? The different scientific disciplines. And I give you a little bit background of that. Yesterday, I, I, uh, I participated in an event about with the teacher at the K-12 uh, uh, educational system in Italy. And, and we discussed how to teach, how to educate uh, um, on climate change. And uh, the feedback that we got after our uh, intervention was, uh, it is not my subject, right? I am in favor of teaching climate change but it doesn't fall into my subject. And then I said, you know, the climate change is not a discipline. Climate change is a, a bill that we are paying for, for an unsustainable past. So it, it really needs to be brought to any subject uh, uh, that you are teaching, whether this is uh, civic education, whether this is science, whether this is uh, history or something else. So all the subject uh, and, and use the opportunity to uh, to the same probably applies to the scientific institution. We really need to uh, go beyond the silos, the, the traditional disciplinary uh, division. It, uh, I am not trying to discard that, but, but, but we really need to create structure that happens. This... Okay, I think. Yara, you're breaking up a little bit there. 
but I think you just finished your point of in, uh, you're breaking up right towards the end. So uh, we got it and, and interdisciplinarity, I think leads really well in, into what Joe might be saying. So Joe, I can see you also have your hands up there. Thanks, thanks Chloe. Yeah, I mean, I, I, think, I think in terms of the evidence, you know, building the evidence, I think the evidence for, for some, you know, recognizing the rights of local and indigenous communities um, and the climate benefits that has is, is pretty clear. It's more a question of political will. I think in in practical terms, I think there's there's, there's definitely a body of work there to look at to look at the look more deeply into the climate mitigation potential of nature based solutions. That as a, as, a, as I said, it's been touted as being at, you know thirty five percent within within ten years. I, I think it's probably more in the lower percentage point. So look, delving more into that. Um, Looking in, you know, at, at the moment, nature-based solutions is quite a loosely defined concept. It can it can incorporate protected areas, it can incorporate plantations, whatnot. Um, it, it can also incorporate monoc monoculture plantations, which, as I said previously, are quite environmentally destructive. So, what what do ecologically sound nature-based solutions look like, and how they and how can they be implemented in Europe and 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 elsewhere? Um, I mean, I, other things, uh, I would say that um, it's important to establish stronger relationships with, with African scientists um, and civil society groups, because um, that, that, that's where the rubber hits the road. Um, stop talking in our silos. And, and finally, yeah, just cross and multidisciplinary um, approaches to these kinds of questions, um, you know, working with social scientists, working with anthropologists, to, to put these kinds of uh, concepts into action. Great, thanks so much for that, Joe. Uh, yeah, good, I'm, I'm not muted, just to double check. Um, so the next question is, um, what is, what do you think, I mean, this is also maybe a little bit hypothetical, but what do you think the impact of the Green Deal is or potentially could be on a global scale? Um, and on the flip side of this, Will the Green Deal, um, you know, targets and things like that be impacted by other countries? So, for example, um, I think Joe Biden has recently made um, renewed the commitment from the US perspective. Is this likely to, do you think, impact the Green Deal? Um, I, I don't know who wants to jump in on this first. I saw Diedrich raise his, raise his eyebrows. I, you might need to unmute yourself, though. Uh, yeah, no, no problem. Um, yeah, well... It was the aim, uh, I didn't elaborate on every aspect of the Green Deal, but it also had a geopolitical uh, context, obviously. And our aim is, as Europe, to, to take the world along on this uh, incredible journey. Um, and uh, only one and a half year ago, the picture of that was pretty gloomy. Uh, we, we were still stuck with President Trump in the White House, uh, and we hadn't heard from the Chinese for a while, um, uh, to mention a few important players on the world stage. But now look at it. Look at the, the situation one and a half years later. Uh, sometimes you need to be lucky. Uh, there's a different administration over there at the other side of the Atlantic. But part of it is also because the Green Deal inspired others to step up their game. Uh, we've seen that from the Chinese. They have different reasons for it. But one of them is also their willingness or their eagerness to be a world player. And they see that the world stage is about climate change at the moment. The G20, the G7, uh, all those big gatherings, they are about climate change. And partly because Europe stepped forward and said, we are not going to wait. Here we are with our ambition, climate neutrality in 2050. Uh, the US, US is now the same ambition for 250. We're still hackling a little on their uh, 230 ambition. But to be fair, it's way better. Uh, it's a difference between night and day compared to what they had, even if you look at the Obama era, by the way. So they really stepped up their game. And from the from the Chinese, we now hear their climate ambition, climate neutrality, 260. Well, obviously, a lot to talk about, for instance, in COP26 in Glasgow at the end of the year. But we are now in a worldwide uh, endeavor, uh, which is completely different from a year ago. And I must say, also very needed because Europe is 10% of, of the world's emissions. Uh, we have a bigger impact because of our markets and our imports, et cetera, but we cannot save the planet on our own. Uh, this, is to, uh, this has to be a worldwide uh, project and it starts becoming one. 
Thanks. Is it, do any of the other speakers want to jump in? Feel free to switch your microphones off and... Nope. All right. Maybe next question then. This one, the next question I'm going to ask is actually a question from the audience and it might be more actually directed to the scientists on the panel here. Um, so it's from David Cockrell and he he says he, you know, he's very happy about the Green Deal taking place, but he is a, a, a little bit, uh, what, what was the wording here? He's, he's wondering if it's happening too slow. So it, the, he's wondering whether the Green Deal will work fast enough to slow down things like climate change or whether even more action is needed. Now, I know the Green Deal's, uh, Claire actually mentioned this in a presentation as well, some of the Green Deal's targets are very ambitious. So I guess it's sort of trying to see whether the question is whether the Green Deal's targets are you know, too ambitious. Are they achievable? Or do we even need to push further and do things faster? <laughs> Any thoughts on that? Maybe I'll jump to Claire. Yeah, so I think that the objectives and the targets of the Green Deal are quite ambitious. As I showed you, those of the soil mission, of the mission on the healthy soils and food are even more ambitious, but they are taken up by, uh, by the Commission. Uh, well, I think the question behind is uh, what will be the enabling conditions for stakeholders to implement the practices that will allow to reach the targets. Uh, so we re really need fair and uh, efficient uh, incentive systems to, uh, for promoting uh, the achievement, the delivery of ecosystem services in different ecosystems and from different uh, natural resources such, such as soil, water, biodiversity. So for me, yeah, the Green Deal does not completely give the tools, the incentives, uh, part of them can be the cap. Well, there's a lot of discussion out there. Um, yes, and maybe I do not know enough uh, what is in the Green Deal, but yes, it, may, it will depend on incentives, on creating the enabling conditions for stakeholders. Thanks very That's much. It. Joe, any thoughts on this particular issue? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I you know, um, just being, I, I guess it's a standard argument, isn't it? Just being am, ambitious in terms of de decarbonizing our economy and and not 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 conflating um, that that kind of imperative uh, to decarbonize with 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 kind of offsetting and you know commit commit to real emissions reductions. Um, yeah. <laughs> So I can see Yarrow with his hand up. And I mean, I know the, the EU Mission Board on Climate Adaptation Societal Transformation is also quite ambitious. So Yarrow, what do you have to say? Thank you. I hope the connection is better now and you can hear me. I can't. So you know, I think Green Deal uh, encompasses many commitments and many objectives and uh, tangible targets by 2030 and by 2050. Uh, so if I understand the question right, is it more about, you know, is Green Deal ambitious enough in order to stop climate change in time? If this is the question, I, uh, I think, uh, you know, personally, I would believe that the Green Deal is, is really ambitious and it, it, it pushed forward the frontier of ambition uh, really uh, to the point where it, it, it doing more would probably not be politically feasible, right? Um, so we have the uh, intermediate target of 55% of, of uh, reduction of greenhouse uh, gas emission in uh, by 2030, which is in nine years, right? It's a, it's huge. And, uh, and carbon neutrality by 2050, it's, it's really ambitious. We, we still need to develop the uh, the pathways, the trajectories, how to reach that goal. But if the question is whether the science is fast enough in order to inform already ambitious Green Deal, then I would uh, perhaps answer, uh, of course, what we are planning for, especially in the mission on climate adaptation by uh, in the Horizon Europe and, uh, and beyond, uh, is uh, of course a uh, research innovation that will take some time in order to be materialized and inform the transition processes. What we really need to do is to harness also the, the research that was completed under Horizon 2020. So we really need to, to work uh, uh, 
on deploying the the innovation that we developed in the past and uh, and see it uh, uh, you know work in the practice so there was uh, not always you do, horizon europe will definitely deliver new uh, innovative solution and actionable knowledge but we still you know have a task to exploit what we have developed before thank you thanks arrow so just finally to come in on this question if you'd like to Diedrich, do you have anything to add or respond to Again, sorry, you have to unmute yourself. No, no problem. Uh, I'm, I'm working. Um, well, it's the, yeah, obviously, uh, my answer to uh, whether the question is the Green Deal far, uh, ambitious enough. Uh, well, it's it's formally yes. <laughs> I can't say anything else. Um, but I am also convinced that, uh, of it as a person. Um, the problem, obviously, is that we anticipate that the rest of the world has to go through a similar effort. And then it will be enough, or at least, uh, well, with the, all the uncertainty that you know more about in terms of bandwidth of climate change effects and climate change models, but it could be, it's sort of in the midst of the bandwidth of where we need to go. But this is all provided that the rest of the world is uh, coming along. And it's, it's very interesting to see that, for instance, I think this morning, the New York Times published on the basis of what Yesterday, what was announced yesterday in the Biden summit uh, by the US and, and adding that to Europe and adding that to China. And they sort of start to show that if that continues, the world might be on a pathway to avoiding devastating climate change. Uh, and that's pretty good news, but it's a, a, a bit running in uh, ahead of itself in terms of, uh, for instance, we don't know what India is actually up to, Brazil, uh, there's, there's quite a few big emitters that are still in the dark. And, and this is very important that we need to take them along in that journey towards uh, climate neutrality. Great, thanks. So I have, I'm just, so one other question in the chat that I really do like, and this is uh, from Lorik, and she says, my question stems from my lack of knowledge on economics. As a geoscientist, I have a broad idea on what we can do to fix climate change, but I have no idea how feasible it is on an economic, from an economic point of view. The European Green Deal is a growth plan incorporating environmental and economic aspects, as, as well as many others. And I'm wor wondering on what level these aspects are combined to make a general action plan. Is this only at a policy making level? Do you think we need to have courses in universities where we combine climate mitigation techniques with economics um, or something else? So quite a lot of aspects to this question. Does anyone feel like jumping in to address it or, or maybe comment on it more generally? Did you already unmuted if you want to yeah. jump in? Yeah, no, no, uh, I, I didn't want to be the first. Uh, but this is obviously, uh, you could call it uh, the $1 million question, how to combine those two. As I said in my introduction, it raised quite some eyebrows if you say that we want to combine economic growth with those environmental objectives. There's a lot of people out there, and I was one of them once, that uh, argued that you cannot combine the economic growth um, with those sustainable objectives. Uh, and it, it, it is also not self-evident. Um, growth has not only a speed, uh, but it also has a direction. And I think we are focusing too much on that speed, which is the 2.1% growth of the GDP each year, and all those figures that you see in the paper. The direction is actually much more important. And that requires much more knowledge and insights on how you steer the direction of economic growth. I mean, and we have been fighting, or we, or the environmental movement, or people that question economic growth are always questioning that figure, the 2.1 or the 3, it should be lower uh, in, in order to meet the sustainable ability objectives, they argue. And I argue that that figure isn't, isn't relevant. Uh, the, the direction is much more relevant, but it's much more difficult. To, to show it, to steer it. I mean, every one of us is getting up every morning uh, with the ambition to do, do a little bit better. And we, we want to be a little bit better in our work. We want to teach our kids a little more. We want to uh, read an extra book. Uh, that's our ambition as a person. Well, 7 billion persons do that every morning. And that's called economic growth. 
uh, because every morning we do, every day we want to do a little better. And the challenge is to channel that growth into the right direction, into a sustainable direction. And that is possible, but it requires more knowledge. So my answer would be a foolhardy yes to that question. That you as a scientific community could lead the way in trying to combine those two things. Uh, because as I said, that's pretty difficult. Okay, I can also see uh, Joe with his hand up virtually. Yeah, just 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 uh, just on the um on the financing um side of things, you know, I mean Mark Carney, the the UN special envoy on on finance and climate change. Uh, you know, recently said that uh, net zero and and nature is the greatest commercial opportunity of our age. Um, so yeah, I mean um, that could be a good thing or it could be a very bad thing. Um, uh, you know, it's it, and it kind of underlines the need for for the in, for the enabling conditions um, to happen. Um, you know, I said you know securing the rights of local indigenous communities. Um, the governance, the science, that that all needs to be in place. Otherwise, you know, we we risk seeing land grabs um, um, and, and and pretty pretty unsound projects. So um, yeah, uh, it's it's an opportunity, but we need to make sure the other pieces of the jigsaw are in place as, as well. Absolutely. Now, I, I would like to move on to one more um, uh, question from the Q&A box, because I do also really like this one. Um, it's from Martin, and I think I'm going to address it to Yaro first, because I think it links up quite well here with his um, uh, citizen assemblies. So firstly, Yaro, and if any other uh, panellists want to jump in on this afterwards, feel free. Um, can we say that the Green Deal is a lot about changing human behaviour? How can we tackle that? So to get the, the societal features changing and that sort of thing. <laughs> Thank you. It, it is really a like, good question. I mean, I would almost say, personally, I would say, you know, the Green Deal set very ambitious target and very, very ambitious, uh, you know, policy objectives. And those can only be reached if you change the behavior, right? So in principle, yes, you can say, I mean, the core, of the research and innovation behind is uh, really how we how we um, uh, motivate, how we um, incentivize the behavioral change. Uh, that might be consumer choices. That might be the way how we uh, socialize in our communities. That might be a number of things, right? But the, uh, how we address risk, how we how, how we cope with risk, and so on. So the behavioral change uh, uh, is absolutely at the critical cornerstone on the pathway to meet the Green Deal's objectives and targets. I, I would definitely agree with that. And that reconnects also with my last slide from my introductory talk, where uh, as scientists, we really need to think uh, hard about how to, how to incorporate, assimilate uh, the incentives, the nudges, the behavioral research into our methods across the different disciplines and across the different policy uh, advising, policy support tools. So yes, so, uh, I would uh, give full endorsement for uh, societal transformation, behavioral research as a core of the Green Deal. Thank you. Great answer. Thank you, Yara. Does anyone else want to jump into this before our final question? No, I think that's probably a good thing because we are fast running out of time. Um, the two hours have just flown by. So I'm gonna ask my final question now, and this is a, a bit of a fun one. I'm, I'm quite interested to see how the speakers answer this. So the question is, the Green Deal's long-term targets reach up until 2050. Now, I want you to imagine that we are in 2051. What does the world look like and what are our next steps? Who would like to go first? Um, so I go first because I have to run off after that question. Sounds so good. Sounds I'm, good. I'm pretty uh, impolite already. Um, <laughs> well, it, we actually thought about more than 250. We we concluded, as I said in the introduction, the climate law uh, on uh, Tuesday night, actually at five o'clock in the morning, the negotiations ended because one question was still out there on the table: What do we do next? And in terms of climate change, we have already uh, agreed that we would go negative, which is pretty positive. Uh, because we would go into removals being bigger than emissions uh, as of 2050. 
But that was not a real question. The real question is, what does the world look like by then? And I hand over to you for that, because I have a lot of imagination and I can sketch all kinds of pictures, but I would like science to be in, uh, in the lead in that, in, in leading the way towards that, well, must be beautiful future, but I'm not sure how, what and how it looks like. Uh, and so I leave that up to the scientist um, to, as I said, guide us into that future, because that's your job. Uh, with that, I say congratulations to, uh, to you uh, for all your work, and I hope to see you sometimes in real life. Great. Thanks for that uh, inspiring answer. <laughs> Thanks so much for joining us. Uh, I'm, I'm going to pass straight on over to Claire, who I can see has her hand up. Yes, so maybe I'll start. Well, it would be great to be in 2051 with the Green Deal targets uh, reached, because I think we would be in a much greener world, uh, yes, uh, literally much greener and more sustainable. Uh, still, I think, so yes, nearly difficult to imagine <laughs> what it would be. Um, still, I think that there will be issues because the population is going to continue to grow. And hence, there will be still discussions, not only in Europe, but in the whole world about how to share, how to distribute the land, and the resources and uh, yes, access to, to land, access to food and how to build, how to devise sustainable cities because many, uh, the proportion of uh, urban population is planned to continue to grow. So I guess there will be challenge, challenge there, but well, it would be great to be there in 2050 with yeah, the targets achieved. So yeah, that's it. Fingers crossed. I can see uh, Yarrow was unmuted, but he's muted again. If you wanted to jump in, I I, I can be the last because I okay. spoke in. Okay, in that case, Joe. Joe also has his hand up. So great. <laughs> okay. Um. So yeah. Um. 2050. I mean, you know, it's estimated that uh, local and indigenous communities uh, number around mm -hmm. two point five mm -hmm. billion people around the world. Um, and yeah. customarily manage around 50%, um, including some of the world's most rich ecosystems, but they, they legally own just 10%. Um, so I would like to think, and this goes somewhat beyond the EU Green Deal, I'd like to think that that we start to, um, that 10% that figure um, comes to nearer the 50% figure, as I said, as a precondition for, for a healthier, more equitable planet, planet. I'll leave it there. Something to aim towards. Thanks, Joe. So Yaro, last but not least. Yeah, no, no thank you. Now, of course, we are more concerned about what might get wrong um, and prevent us uh, um, from being there where we intended to be in 2050. But I like that question. So if we are in 2050, I will not speak about mitigation, but in terms of adaptation, when you look at this, uh, you know, inspiring uh, ambition, um, of EU adaptation strategy to be climate resilient, climate resilient by 2050. And we have, uh, we are using a similar target in the mission, la, at least part of Europe and part of, la, you know, should be climate resilient by 2030. But what does it mean climate resilient? It doesn't mean that the extreme climate event will not occur again. So the resilience is a set of moving target. So we will, in 2050, we will still face a world with inequalities, economic and social, and we will still face uh, some environmental uh, degradation uh, to tackle. So for us, probably, you know, the, 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 uh, the work will continue beyond 2050 and, uh, and still finding new ways how to become more resilient against climate variability and uh, hopefully not uh, against climate change at that time. Thank you. Okay, I think that's actually a really great place to end the session today, which is great because we're just one minute over time. Um, I would like to firstly say a huge, huge thank you to all of our speakers for joining us here today. Um, and also to my fellow co-conveners who this session wouldn't have happened without them. So thank you so much to everyone who helped with the session. Um, and finally, thank you to all of the participants who uh, asked questions in the chat box, in the Q&A box. Um, I'm sorry we couldn't get to all of the questions today, but I will be doing a follow-up blog post on this. So you can look out for that. Um, otherwise, I hope everyone enjoys the rest of the day today. I hope you enjoy the rest of AGU online next week. And we hope to see you in Vienna next year.